compliance. Um, for the uh, company, it's a, it's a Kenyan-owned company. So with this, I would like to urge you to encourage most of your patients to use Cosmos products because it's a Kenyan-owned company, company and when you buy Kenya, you build Kenya. So it's a family-owned business. We're in the third generation. And Dr. Vimal Patel is the, is the one leading it currently, and he's one of your members. He was chair, uh, chairing one, he was in the panel of one of the sessions in manufacturing, and some of you might uh, have inter interacted with him there. And he's seen the business grow, and we are now currently um, available in, our products are available in 12 sub-Saharan um, African countries, and we employ over 500 people, you'll see in the next slides, who are all Kenyans. So our aim is to get international recognition. So thank you, um, doc, that's Dr. Prakash Patel in that slide, you can see him, and some of you must have interacted with him during your early years in the practice. And he's currently 81 years old, still strong, and uh, taking some of the Cosmos med medicines. And that, that slide is just showing the history of success for Cosmos. So he started the move to Kenya in uh, 1959, and the first manufacturing plant was uh, put up in 1978. So we have an experience of, uh, of, of uh, 40, 42 years yeah, in manufacturing. So some, to highlight some of the milestones is uh, in, 19, in 2004, Cosmos was the first company to be given the license to manufacture ARVs. And of course, with that, it brought down the price significantly of the ARVs. Then in 2008, of course, the GMP block was put up in 2007. Then 2008, we got the PIC certification. This is a credible certification that is given by the German government on GMP. The GMP inspectors come from uh, Europe, which is German. Then we also got in 2015, uh, the USAID certification and of course with that we are gaining leadership and still going strong of course with partnerships from um, you members of PSK and other partners. Next slide please. So of course when we got this license to manufacture the first ARVs it made a news headline in BBC as you can see and the price of the drugs went significantly down from $38 to half half of that and of course that benefited a lot of kenyans who were having hiv then and of course they still continue to benefit from that next slide please so in terms of the registration and the formulations over 300 which cuts across all therapeutic areas and as you can see there are some diabetes antibiotics antihistamines anti-inflammatory we also have veterinary tb so when you work in your pharmacy or your institution just know you uh, the therapeutic areas from Cosmos are vast and you can get uh, a Cosmos product for most of those uh, therapeutic areas. So feel free to check what Cosmos has before you go for another alternative. Next. So those are some of the active markets, of course, being led by Kenya. So we are looking to grow into more markets. So um, about uh, 12, 12 countries and it's across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. So this is just to show you uh, preference of um, uh, in terms of the units uh, consumed uh, in the Kenyan market. This is data from the Iquivia. It's a uh, consumed products uh, units by units, not um, value by units in Kenya. So this is as at uh, the moving annual total as at August 2020. And um, what this slide is just showing you is the preference of the affordable medicines. So if you looked at this picture in 2017, you'd have seen it's mainly the multinationals that would have been at the top. But now this picture is changing because of the preference of the customers and of course because of uh, affordability and accessibility. So Cosmos is one of the leaders you can see here and these are millions of uh, people that are taking these, um, have, have been able to take these medicines. And with this, I can tell you, especially in terms of the um, uh, the chronic medication, the non-communicable diseases, you find that um, at least in diabetes, your sister, cousin, grandmother, uncle, or you name it, will be will have been on a Cosmos drug. Nogluk being one of our flagship brands, we've impacted people, patients, and that is what we look to to do. So, with uh, continue to the next slide, please. 
um, uh, this slide just shows uh, how we, we are focusing on quality. And uh, like I'd mentioned in the earlier slide, we have about 500 staff. And this is the distribution of the number of staff in the, in the company, production, quality control, engineering. And what this just says is that we are focusing on quality. So the highest number of our staff are concentrated in quality, in, in quality control, quality assurance. So again, that just um, guarantees you uh, uh, that you'll get quality products from Cosmos because that is what we are focusing on in terms of even human resource. Next. So uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, we are able to reach you wherever you are uh, in, the, in the regions, we have a very strong uh, sales and distribution team. And uh, this is just a picture of the Cosmos sales team and uh, a picture of our warehouse, which is uh, quite big. Uh, to to take to uh, to stock quite a number of products as you've seen in the vast therapeutic areas, and uh, we we are also um, doing activities in with you uh, the pharmacist in the different uh, regions. And this is just a picture of a pharmacist who's wearing a, a Cosmos dust coat. So we do partner in in various ways to ensure that um, we are interacting with you and educating you on our products and ensuring that you are able to get information about our products. As, as, as quite as often as possible. And with that, you can see in terms of the customers, we cut across NGOs, hospitals, wholesalers, and of course, we also work with government. So we really count on you as partners to ensure that we achieve our main uh, vision and objective. Next slide, please. So in terms of product de development, we are focusing and continuously improving on this. And with this, we've equipped our lab. We have a state of art lab that uh, uh, develops these formulations. And m some of you might have in, uh, seen or interacted with this product, Hatties and Glucowellmet, which are new molecules in, um, in the non communicable diseases. Hatties being rivaroxaban, an anticoagulant, the first uh, uh, generic from uh, Kenya. So, and uh, Vildagliptin and Metformin, a combination of uh, uh, two antidiabetics which are also quite um, well accepted in the market and being used uh, quite well to, to help uh, improve uh, lives of patients. So uh, what we just need to assure you is that uh, we do manufacture our products using the British and United States pharmacopoeia and we are continuously increasing this and uh, venturing into all these new molecules with an, a target of uh, uh, at least introducing 10 highly effective products per year. So keep watching our space to see uh, which are some of these products that we are continuously bringing into the market that are developed in-house. Next. So that's just a picture of our facility. And uh, with this, I would like to let you know that you're welcome to come to Cosmos and visit and tour the plant just to see where these products are made. And that's the advantage of having a Kenyan company. You can actually go and see where these products are being made. So these are just snippets of the factory. It would be nice for you to just come in, see how uh, the processes are being done, ask questions. And of course, for the younger pharmacists, we also have a program where they come there to intern and learn and just see have first-hand experience from a local manufacturer. Next slide. So we have um, the facility sits on uh, 300 square feet and uh, this is the distribution from five manufacturing blocks. Uh, we have a warehouse, finished goods store, and of course a staff canteen. Next slide. And in terms of capacity, just to reiterate that we have uh, capacity to, to come up with solutions for most of your needs. Uh, tablets and liquids, we have we can manufacture up to 1.2 million per shift. Oral liquids, ointments, creams, external liquids, dry, um, just to mention a few. So we have the capacity to ensure we can meet the needs and of course impact positively on the, on the Kenyans and the uh, population, which is what uh, is our aim. Next. So to Finalize, this is just a slide showing some of our partners. And of course, you can see PSK, you are there. So um, as I end my presentation, I would just like to urge you to please um, 
continue supporting Cosmos as a, as a local manufacturer, of course, uh, buying Kenya, building Kenya, and would like you to share with us feedback because you're the ones who interact with the, with the customers. That cannot be overemphasized. You're the first people who come in touch with the customers, so uh, we aim to continuously improve. So we ask that you, you do share feedback about us and our products, and of course, we are open to any new initiatives that are patient-focused. We are happy to partner with you to ensure we foster this ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Susan. Okay. And thank you to Cosmos. They are excellent supporters of PSK and the pharmacy profession. Thank uh, you. You went five minutes over time, so you owe us another 50,000. Please arrange for the check. <laughs> We'll, we'll pay for that. <laughs> but thank you very much and for the audience too. Um, so pre-COVID, uh, there was a men's conference. I know many of you uh, were attending because I saw you there. Uh, I was presenting that day and I just wanted to share with you my thoughts on that men's conference for which I was given a standing ovation. So I was talking about five ways for a man to be completely happy. Number one, be with a woman who makes you laugh. Number two, be with a woman who gives you her time. Number three, be with a woman who takes care of you. Number four, be with a woman who really loves you. And number five, finally, make sure these four women don't know about each other. Great. We're now. Good uh, one, Dr. Anis. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Good one. Thank you very much. And for convening, making uh, today very vibrant. You're such a, 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 an energetic uh, and hilarious. Thank you. I'll send <laughs> you my bill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to go into a five-minute stretch break. Uh, for those of you who have been diligently sitting on your chairs and listening to all the presentations. However, we have a, um, a, a presentation, a video that will be played. And also, we, NEC has come up with a, NEC has come up with a Jerusalem a challenge. So if you go to our, our YouTube channel, the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya YouTube channel, and you subscribe to that channel, you will see the NEC members doing Jerusalem a challenge. So please do that in the break. We shall be back in, you can take your stretch. And while you're watching the Jerusalem a challenge, you can also join in in your office and uh, make sure you hip hop along to that tune. And uh, we shall see you in five minutes and we shall be introducing the next panel. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Eric and I'll quickly take you through the process of subscribing to a CPD event, claiming CPD tokens, and I'll also address the challenges you're likely to encounter in the process. When you log into your PPB portal, you'll find different icons, but the ones that are most important to CPD are the ones called CPD, the one of claim tokens, and the one of self-reporting. How do you subscribe to a CPD event? When we say subs make sure you subscribe, we, we mean you visit your portal, come to this CPD icon, which leads to all the events that are coming. And how do you subscribe? Uh, I've already subscribed to all the days of the conference, so I'll demonstrate with this event provided by KNH, and I'll click subscribe, then subscribe to event. It will tell me you've already subscribed to this event, follow up with the provider. Whenever you are subscribing, you want to avoid uh, clicking subscribe in quick succession on different events because then it is only the first that will be captured. The rest will say already subscribed. subscribe you can confirm if you are successful the change of color the color the black button to a gray button that tells already subscribed you can as well come back to claim tokens uh, where you've grabbed to um, 
refresh that page you'll see whether the subscription was successful or not it is very important to make sure that your subscription is confirmed because the token that you send after the event can only be claimed under the events that you've subscribed so once you subscribe and after you attend the event if it's this conference you'll receive a token so we send tokens to all participants whenever you receive a token it's you'll come under claim tokens to claim it for example i'll demonstrate with a token i received for the world family webinar which was done in conjunction with gsk i'll come here to claim token I will paste my token here and I will claim points. It will tell me that I've been awarded one point. This is the point. I've already been awarded. Um, usually there are some issues that you encounter. It will tell you that that token is invalid or it's expired. It's when you claim the token, where do you get that? It's when you claim the token under a different event. For example, the Tencent token, if I bring it to another event, it will give me an error. It will say, for example, this one will say the token is invalid because it's a different, it's a token for a different event. Another issue that, you'll, that uh, members complain is that uh, they say I cannot find the event under the so under the claim tokens. That means your subscription was not successful. You either clicked in quick succession or you did not confirm whether the subscription was successful or not. It is important to note that subscribing is very important if you are to get that point. Attending an event without subscribing means the token that will send you will not help. It will not be of benefit to you. So it's always important to subscribe to all the events um, for, for, for CPD to work for you. Panelists for the conference will be receiving two, two points per presentation, the panelists and abstract presenters, and these will be up before the end of the conference. Thank you very much. All right, great. I hope all of you had a good stretch break and uh, you saw uh, our team shaking and moving. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, you still have uh, until the end of uh, the next hour to catch us in action. Uh, my, my job now is to introduce to you uh, the moderator for the next panel who will take it us on for the next hour. Uh, we'll, this will take us till 1.30, from 12.30 to 1.30. I'd like to hand over the mic to Dr. Franco Fuller, who can uh, introduce himself and uh, the very distinguished panel that is going to be talking about policy and regulatory framework for primary healthcare. Over to you, Dr. Franco Fuller. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me know. Uh, if I'm not audible enough, I'm in a new place, so I'm still trying to uh, figure out the best connection. I, I won't say much about myself. I, I think it's in there, and I should be able to access that after the conference. But I'm primarily based at the Stratton University Inst Institute of Healthcare Management as faculty and, uh, and, and as research as well, as a researcher. And in front of us, uh, we have what I consider to be a very powerful uh, panel of uh, three members, three tall figures within the profession. Uh, Jared Nyakiba, uh, who 
is somebody I've known, I realize now for about 20 years, yeah, that's not a short, short period. He's an assistant chief pharmacist uh, with the Ministry of Health and he's part of the UH, UHC secretariat uh, within the ministry. I think uh, mostly, you know, supporting uh, supply chain matters within the public sector. Serves also on the anti-doping uh, body of the World Health uh, Athletics and Athletic Championships. I think he's been doing that for, for a number of years now. He's currently a doctoral fellow uh, doing his PhD in, in public health policy. He has a master's, actually I think he has two master's degrees, uh, which, you know, should be quite inspirational to some of our younger colleagues. So Jared has a master's in public health, uh, health services management, uh, but he also has a master's in clinical pharmacy, which allows him to, to double up. And yeah, so his interests are um, primarily around UHC. I know Jared, you and I have you know, interacted and worked a bit around the UHC arena as well. And basically issues around safety and quality within healthcare systems, including pharmaceutical services. So welcome, Jared. Uh, my next panelist, uh, the next slide is uh, Dr. Chen, Wilfredo Chen. Again, uh, uh, he's been with the Pharmacy and Poisons Board uh, you know, uh, for the longest time, uh, most of us can remember. He has a bachelor's uh, degree in pharmacy, of course, and a master's in pharmaceutical sciences from the UK. He also has an MBA uh, from the University of Nairobi. Uh, so Wilfred, again, somebody I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, working very closely with uh, in a number of years, uh, primarily when I was providing some support to the World Bank Group. I think Wilfred had been seconded to be part of a team that reviewed the way inspections are done to improve pharmacy practice. So that's basically been his area around how to make inspections uh, more effective and, you know, how to improve practice, pharmacy practice at the front line. He currently serves as the Director of Pharmacy Practice and Regulation and Training at, at the board. And he's also a Chairman, uh, Board of Trustees of the Pharmacy and Poisons Board Staff Pension Scheme. So, uh, Wilfred, and I'm sure he'll have an opportunity to interact with you, but uh, he recognizes the changing roles of pharmacists within the society and the need for training to expand to actually embrace that. That's going to be part of uh, the discussion that we're actually going to be having this afternoon. And the final panelist, uh, maybe to say last but certainly not least, uh, maybe just might want to go back, is Professor Guantai, who probably doesn't need a lot of introduction for most of us. Uh, she was our dean I, when I was at the School of Pharmacy uh, many years ago. I see she has over 20 years administrative and management experience. I'd argue a lot more than that, perhaps, a tall figure in this area. And she chairs the Kenya. The Kenyatta National Hospital and University of Nairobi Ethics and Research Committee. She's a member of PSK and the Women Pharmacists Associations as well. And she's a founder and chair of the Kenya Society of Basic and Applied Pharmacology. Very, very importantly, she's a professor of pharmacology and therapeutics at the School of Pharmacy, an educationist, mentor, and opinion leader in the, in the field of pharmacy and a mentor for, all of, for, for a lot of us really, really, and, you know, I have to argue as well. So welcome Professor Guantai as well. So we actually have a very interesting uh, uh, discussion here uh, because we are talking, we are putting the words, you know, primary healthcare within a pharmacy uh, context of a pharmacy discussion. That isn't something that, that was common during my, you know, my time. Uh, training as a pharmacist or certain even, you know, practicing after that. And, you know, in a sense, it, it helps us to actually recognize how we are looking at primary healthcare and how that has changed. And of course, our working definition through these discussions and through the conference is primary healthcare being, you know, a whole society approach to health and well-being, primarily centered on the needs and preferences of individuals, families and communities with a strong focus on addressing the broader determinants of health, focusing on comprehensive rather than you know, just uh, curative or treatment uh, services. And, uh, you know, for many years, pharmacists was, were not necessarily seen uh, as being a core part of that. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, we, we know that that's changing rapidly because we, you know, there's a lot of discussion around Look, not just treating the disease, but making sure that you take care of an entire human being, 
That basically means a pharmacist, obviously, who is the entry and the exit point of the health system, plays a very important role as well. So, again, you're not here to listen to me. We are here to listen to the panelists. And maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Nyakiba. You know, you sit up your house and you're smack in the middle of policy. What is it that you expect? What is the government's defined role for pharmacists within the broader universal health coverage agenda? Uh, thank, you, thank you, Frank. Um, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to all the participants and uh, fellow panelists. So that's a good question. That's a good place to start. Uh, so, of course, I am biased. So I want to start with um, a general aspiration for UHC. Uh, and our general aspiration for UHC is that all Kenyans um, can access a particular set of essential services that they need um, when they need them. Uh, and these are quality services without uh, necessarily going through financial hardships or impoverishment. So um, in that case, and we usually say that uh, UHC is through primary health care. Um, so no primary health care, no UHC. So when you look at primary health care, and, and, uh, and in fact, now that we're having a policy and a regulatory discussion also, let me start by highlighting the Kenya Primary Healthcare Strategic Framework 2019-2024 uh, uh, that was launched this year um, that tries to strengthen primary healthcare services uh, to achieve UHC. And if you look at that goal, it aims to reduce the burden of health needs uh, through universal access to this comprehensive set of primary healthcare services. Um, and it has several components uh, that will guide in terms of how we see the pharmacist in this. So several components. So number one is service delivery. Uh, that's a common one. Uh, so this is more of our traditional role in, um, you know, uh, dispensing of medicines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then there's a commodity supply chain and infrastructure component. Again, a traditional role in terms of our you know, manufacturing, distributing, wholesaling, and dispensing of use uh, of medicine. Um, then we also have another one on health information and management systems. I think this is one of the areas that we need to maybe um, uh, go into. And another one on uh, human resources for health. So when you look at the primary healthcare strategic framework, one of the, um, one of the activities or areas around human resource for health um, is the formation of multidisciplinary teams. So these multidisciplinary teams in level one, two, three, and four yeah, in a primary care network, this multidisciplinary team will be coordinating and providing care to Kenyans in that level. So, and one of the, of course, uh, recognized uh, members of that team is a pharmacist. So that's interesting. And then lastly, the, the issues around leadership and management. Um, traditionally, pharmacists have not been seen as uh, leaders and managers in the healthcare system. I think that has been a secondary, um, uh, you know, option. So I think this is also one of those areas to go into. So in terms of primary healthcare, let me just mention also services. Um, so services, and there are many, I just want to mention key ones that are related to this discussion. Vaccination, screening, prevention and control, of course, treatment and management, that's standard. Um, emergency care services and public health services. So now coming to the question uh, around, around the role. Um, I honestly, um, thinking through this, um, the role of the pharmacists has, of course, and government is a very conservative uh, organization. Eh? Uh, I think the role of the pharmacist has largely primarily been the traditional sense, which is okay. Um, you know, you don't necessarily change and while abandoning what you are. Um, so the traditional role of dispensing medicines, appropriate medicine use, you know, uh, distributing warehousing, you know, all that, uh, you know, regulation um, and all the other areas in which we, we work. Uh, but I think increasingly um, we, we need to start shifting towards more of 
uh, expanding our roles into these other uh, functions of primary healthcare or of UHC uh, that also provide opportunity, like the ones I've mentioned. Uh, I know pharmacists, there's been a recent drive by PSK, you know, vaccinations at the pharmacy level. So how do we scale that up to all pharmacies? You know, that kind of question. Um, I think that's, that's where we need to go. Um, so, but generally in terms of policy, I, I forgot to mention one. Um, so all this is also captured in the UHC policy and in the community health uh, services uh, policy, uh, which are also just recently, you know, being completed. So to the question of the role, the, I think the government sees the pharmacists, uh, and, and I'm not speaking for government, I'm just uh, speaking in terms of my assessment of this, is been majorly traditional, and that's okay. Uh, however, we've had offshoots where pharmacists have gone into various areas that are non-traditional and excelled, in fact, done an amazing job. Um, and I can see that from the previous presentation. So um, I think Generally, that's how I would summarize around the role of the pharmacist in, in UHC and in the role of the pharmacist in, uh, in, what, in, in primary healthcare. Um, one of the outcomes of UHC is 100% access, right? 100% access uh, to um, essential medicines and medical supplies or quote unquote availability issues. So, which means that seems, to, you know, that is a major role around UHC and primary health care. How do we make sure that medicines are available and they are appropriately being used as we contain costs? So that seems to be, of course, in terms of role, uh, the major role. Maybe I'll stop there for now. Uh, Frank, thank you. Thank you, Jared. That was uh, very comprehensive. I mean, you did talk about, uh, you know, the traditional uh, building blocks, as you know them, human resource and leadership. Of course, you mentioned supply chain, which is primary. But you also mentioned a few interesting uh, areas, you know, like screening at primary health care level, because that's our main interest here. You know, vaccination, providing uh, preventive services, you know, and based treatment and based at the community level, at the primary health care level. So, uh, Dr. Chen, I'll drop you in a little bit. And uh, my... Yes, it's my intention to make you a little uncomfortable uh, by just trying to find out whether you feel regulation fits you know, some of the things that have been mentioned within this scope uh, outside the traditional dispensing. Do you feel like uh, we might be facing a case you know, where you know, practice uh, is preceding regulation? Or do you think under the existing regulatory framework, it's quite okay for pharmacies to venture into some of these non-traditional areas that, you know, Jared has talked about, you know, screening, uh, you know, for certain cancers or other diseases, NCDs, providing medical advice and, and of course, primary health care, the comprehensive package at pharmacy level. What are your thoughts uh, on how that fits in with, with the practice regulation, which, of course, is your document? Uh, thank you, Frank, and uh, good afternoon to all participants. And now, I think that is uh, quite challenging. Uh, the services that uh, Jared has mentioned, and even in addition to that, other services like substance abuse, uh, individual health education, and uh, they are all in elimination of communicable diseases and others. You know, basically, uh, as it is right now, CAP 244 uh, doesn't make provisions that uh, kind of would declare those services illegal or unlawful. Uh, but then uh, I'm also aware, as uh, both of you have already alluded to, that uh, when uh, some of these services were being started, like the immunization or vaccination program, I know University of Nairobi, has already conducted training around that. Uh, there is also the one for family planning, which, uh, of course, there is already a package for training pharmacists and pharmaceutical technologists on provision of quality integrated family planning services, which is ready for implementation. And I'm part of uh, uh, the team that is working on that. So, uh, basically, CAP 244 does not prohibit pharmacists from doing that. Uh, it's a case of uh, actually where practice precedes legislation. 
But then uh, if you look at CAP 244 as it is now, uh, specifically I'll refer to amendments that were made to CAP 244 in 2019, May 2019. We have section 3B, uh, 3F, which uh, now provides as a function of PPB to establish or prescribe the different categories of pharmacy business and the scope of practice of persons registered or enrolled in terms of the act or the services or acts which shall for purpose of the act be deemed to be services or acts specific, specifically pertaining to pharmacists or pharmaceutical technologies and the conditions under which those services may be provided or the acts which may be performed. So there is a provision for regulation and which means that uh, at the moment we can go ahead and provide these services at the primary healthcare level and then we build consensus around what needs to be regulated and what regulations we need to put in place and publish them for purposes of uniformity. So that is where we are. There's also another section which uh, provides in those amendments that uh, that is 3B, 3M, that PPB can perform any other function relating to the regulation of the profession of pharmacy. So that is a very broad mandate. And I think uh, there is no harm in proceeding to uh, participate at the primary healthcare level, and then we build consensus and develop the regulations. Thank you. Over back to you. Thank you, Wilfred. Uh, so I, I think we've all had that uh, is crystal clear. Uh, you run as fast as you can before regulation catches up with you, and that's how innovation grows. But of course, you need you know, to be trained, you need to be prepared before you can be in a position to do that. So I'll bring you in, Professor Guantai. Uh, so these non-traditional areas that you're talking about, and there are others, I recognize there are others out there as well, that link directly to primary healthcare services. For instance, Dr. Chen has talked about uh, non-pharmacological management of NCDs, and you know, all of us, well, the majority of us, I would assume, have actually spent a bit of time in community pharmacy, and you remember the number of people would actually come, you know, for it. You know, yeah. Of prescription refills, MCD patients, and and the fact that you know you you know you you needed to talk to them and advise them, and it just was never clear to me. Of course, uh, that's a long time ago. It's, I just like, like to hear from you, uh, Professor Guantai, whether training echoes this, uh, whether you, whether there's there's an attempt or whether successful or not, you know, for, for the training to meet this growing demand or the growing need. What are your thoughts about that? Thank you, um, Dr. Frank Wafula, and, um, and greetings to all uh, the participants. I am very, very uh, happy and privileged to be in this forum uh, where I have a significant number of uh, you know, participants that uh, are at one time or the other under my care. So I'm very, very happy uh, to be at home with you. Now, let me start uh, by saying that um, at this point in time, uh, pharmacists are playing a different game than uh, the game that we used to play when we qualified those many years ago. That is in the, uh, in the 80s. Uh, I'm a graduate of 1978, so you can imagine uh, those number of years. At uh, that time, the pharmacists were few. And uh, the, pharmacies, uh, uh, the pharmacy practice centers were also in very, very few highly <clears throat> uh, privileged areas uh, because uh, the service, that is where um, high level clients uh, would be found. Uh, so mainly the hub and centers are the ones that were served. Uh, currently, I'm happy to note that uh, um, we are very many pharmacists. Pharmacy has grown in terms of training Initially, we only used to have uh, one school of pharmacy that is University of Nairobi. Uh, but as a mother, we have also trained and provided personnel to the other schools of pharmacy that are coming up very, very well. Congratulations to all of them. And uh, I think with that high number of training institutions, then uh, we are assured that uh, we shall have a, a very strong uh, pharmacy workforce. Uh, then um, having said that, uh, let me also say that um, training can either be done uh, in service or pre-service. 
the training that uh, we are involved in is actually both. Uh, we have the um, training within the universities where we have a structured training and we also have the um, uh, in-service training where we can use short courses for those that are practicing and also um, maybe a structured webinars, etc. Et so training um, cuts across uh, various uh, uh, sectors. What they are is that uh, curriculum is dynamic. The curriculum that we used uh, in the 70s is totally different from the curriculum that we are offering today. And therefore, the training that uh, has been provided to pharmacists has uh, been very, very broad based and it will continue to be broad based. Uh, where we provide the basic uh, training, uh, basic science knowledge, and then we have the applied uh, science training. Now, in addition to that, uh, what we've done is that uh, we have also tried to review our curriculum over time so that uh, we include aspects of training that uh, impact uh, soft skills to the practitioners so that they're able to interact with their clients. And therefore, uh, training pharmacists for the uh, public um, primary health care, um, I think is done. We shall continue to improve it. But uh, I think most of it has been done because the curriculum that uh, we have offered for quite a number of years now includes aspects such as um, social and behavioral pharmacy. We have pharmacy management and leadership. Uh, we also have uh, research projects where we train uh, students on uh, research procedures. And we also uh, teach them pharmacy law and ethics. So we give them tools uh, to practice. What I would uh, wish to inform the participants is that um, you can be taught, you can be given a lot of knowledge and a lot of skills, but you need to um, analyze that knowledge and apply it. Uh, and I think that is uh, the missing link. Uh, quite a number of us are lamenting that there are no jobs because they have not been able to unpackage the knowledge that they were given so that they can be able to apply it and deliver. So uh, um, I think uh, knowledge allows creativity, but creativity cannot um, translate to innovation without action. So I'm um, appealing to the uh, pharmacists to make sure that uh, they translate the knowledge that they have acquired so that they become innovators. Recently, we have been involved also in another curriculum review where we uh, are enhancing the course content uh, in our BFAM curriculum. And we have introduced aspects of community health in the training. And I think this is very, very relevant when we are talking about uh, primary health care. Uh, we have also enhanced the, the module on leadership and management. And then uh, instead of just having a research project at the end of uh, the fifth year or the final year of study, we have actually introduced a module of research methodology where we actually are able to train uh, the students before we allocate them projects on how to conceptualize research projects, how to frame research questions, et cetera. And I think this is very, very key um, uh, in the training. Um, so therefore, I can actually say that uh, the training that uh, we offer echoes policy intentions. What we wish to see is a flexible regulatory uh, framework that does not put a lot of um, handles in enhancing the practice of pharmacy as we continue upgrading the knowledge and skills of the practitioners. Thank you. Well, thanks, Prof. Uh, that's quite enlightening. Um, um, so I'll, I'll come to Dr. Cheng in a bit, but just to, Prof, uh, this is for you. You know, one of the, so one of, one of the areas I'm really interested in on an individual level is the history of medicine, basically. And I, I use the word medicine broadly, not just uh, medicine as a practice. And one of the things that fascinates me most is, uh, is what is considered to be the history of you know, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, which mm -hmm. 
seems to have grown from uh, this magical molecule, I think, called streptomycin, because there's a bunch of doctors out there who used to cut up people to look for the TV lesions, and all of them were rendered jobless. One day, when you know TB, you know chemotherapy was discovered, and so that's how they got curious and they started working on the heart. So I'm just wondering whether, in fact, uh, and you know, uh, feel free to, to agree or disagree, whether in fact it might be a good strategy for for the training, almost like the tail wagging the dog, for the training to actually just keep pushing these boundaries and churning out graduates who have these amazing skill sets that go beyond the traditional pharmacy. And once they're out there and they're demanding their space, then the regulator will be forced to adjust so that they remove any barriers that would stop them from working. And, you know, again, uh, I, um, you know, I'd just like to hear your comment on that, on whether, I know we certainly did that with clinical pharmacy, but at some point it looked to be an area that really doesn't fit well with you know, pharmacists, but now we've seen how well that has worked. We're not there yet, but it's worked quite well. And we've seen a number of countries, you know, you've seen what happened, for example, in a number of provinces in Canada in terms of prescribing rights at primary health level for pharmacists, because the provinces in Canada are actually giving them almost full prescribing rights because they've been trained to do that at, at, at undergraduate level. And we see this across a number of countries. So do you think that's a strategy that training institutions, and particularly at the point of developing curricula, should adopt, where they consciously know that this is not a traditional boundary, but you're going to put 45 hours to make sure that these people can actually do that effectively when they get out? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, um, clinical pharmacy is one of the um, uh, modules that uh, we introduced initially at uh, the undergraduate uh, BFAM curriculum uh, and also upscaled it to uh, the postgraduate level where we, are, where we have the uh, MFAM clinical uh, pharmacy program. Um, but um, what we need to note is that um, clinical pharmacy, so to say, should not be seen as a postgraduate training. Clinical pharmacy skills should be imparted in all pharmacy practitioners. I'm talking about the basic uh, clinical pharmacy skills. Uh, I am happy to note that uh, quite a number of the graduates that uh, have graduated from the University of Nairobi and I believe even from the other uh, newer universities have been uh, able to acquire uh, the clinical pharmacy skills from uh, their undergraduate training. Uh, I know for us, uh, we actually teach uh, for uh, three years. Three years, we have modules for that year, fourth year and fifth year in clinical pharmacy. So it's quite strong foundation, uh, which we build on uh, in the postgraduate program. So that is one. Uh, the other one that uh, uh, has helped us to think outside the box and try to help our graduates uh, translate their knowledge in skills is that uh, we have deliberately trying to have um, short courses. And one of them is the immunization or vaccinology training that I think was mentioned earlier where we drew partnerships with the external partners uh, like University of Kansas, we have actually been able to train um, practicing pharmacists on um, a practical uh, administration of vaccines. I think currently we must have trained around 80 of them. The ones that are practicing are few, maybe uh, four or five. Um, so people have the knowledge, as I mentioned earlier, they need to translate that into practice so that uh, the members of the public benefit. Uh, the other area that uh, we are focusing on uh, is the area of uh, emergency uh, management. And uh, what we plan to do is uh, starting early next year, we want to start uh, running some emergency um, management uh, courses and we shall start with uh, the CPR training. So uh, for those that are interested to acquire skills to uh, facilitate emergency management, I think that will be an opportunity for you to uh, participate and also acquire the skills. 
public health pharmacy uh, is an area that uh, is dear to me. I remember many years back, um, uh, Dr. Kiama, Mbiro Kiama, uh, requested to be given leave uh, from Kenyatta National Hospital to go and pursue a master's program in public health pharmacy. And uh, we had a challenge trying to justify to the management why a pharmacist needs to pursue public health. But uh, with a lot of uh, justification and support from the School of Pharmacy, we were able actually to give us a very strong recommendation to uh, Biro Akema to pursue public health pharmacy. And uh, so that was a, a big, big um, uh, push for the profession. Uh, at that point in time also, we noted that uh, pharmacists were not being allowed to join uh, uh, public health programs, including those ones at the University of Nairobi Public School of Public Health, uh, because it was felt that uh, they didn't qualify uh, to enter into public health. But again, with a lot of advocacy and negotiation, I think that handle has been overcome. And right now, um, pharmacists can enroll uh, for masters in public health. Again, that is a major, major development. And having realized that uh, probably the reasons why we were not being allowed to join public health is because the medical doctors felt that uh, we didn't have any uh, community um, <clears throat> community uh, community um, knowledge, community health knowledge, uh, the School of Pharmacy has decided to create a module at the undergraduate level to include community health uh, in the training. And also to ensure that uh, we package our pharmacies to deliver primary health care, another module that we have introduced is on health economics at undergraduate. Just a small a module to ensure that uh, at least we sensitize uh, our graduates on what is required uh, to engage in health systems uh, management. Um, but at the same time, we are actually also developing postgraduate programs in quite a number of areas, including drug discovery and development, and uh, look out uh, for advertisements for these programs uh, sometimes uh, and, uh, next year, maybe uh, June or July, new programs in the School of Pharmacy. So I think we are doing quite well. Um, uh, what we need is actually uh, constant feedback from our graduates on the challenges that they are encountering uh, during their delivery of uh, clinical care or pharmacy care, so that now we can be able to re-engineer our curriculum uh, and include aspects that can build, help them uh, improve on on their practice. So that cust uh, constant customer feedback is very, very critical to us. As now we want to push uh, to engage pharmacists in primary health care, I think it's important for us to probably come up with a questionnaire on training needs assessment for the practicing pharmacists so that we get to understand where they have weaknesses so that we can come in and address them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Cheng, uh, so for you, again, uh, I recognize I'm not being very kind, but are we, are we overly focused on CAP 244 or are there other ways that the regulator can, can create space for some of these uh, innovative, uh, you know, uh, particularly primary healthcare-based, uh, you know, practice spaces? So for instance, what does it take to have uh, a certification program for a primary healthcare pharmacist? Is it a CAP 244 issue? Or are there other regulatory mechanisms that can allow a group of professionals to actually get some kind of board recognized uh, certification uh, or you know, peer practice mechanism that then allows them to comfortably you know, engage you know, get certain special license or engage in practice. Again, I'm asking purely from a point of naivety because I always feel like whenever we talk about uh, reviewing legislation, it just looks like it's really, really hard work that, you know, has to, to go through all these political processes and, you know, has to go through, you know, the parliamentary, you know, processes as well. Are there other ways, and I'm not talking about and a cutting shortcuts. So this could, could either be additional instruments 
or even just you know addition uh, either subsidiary legislation or additions as regulation or rules uh, within a, a main act that, that perhaps might be a bit easier is there any other way to to remove bottlenecks or, or to allow innovation some of these innovations to you know to come to the forefront without necessarily requiring a review of CAP 244. I'm just afraid that you can't review it every two, three years whenever you know, a new practice area comes forward. Thank you, Dr. Wafula. I think I've heard you loud and clear. <clears throat> Let me start by uh, confirming that it is true that uh, review of legislation is a tedious process. It requires a lot of consensus building and also lobbying. Uh, that's why most of the time, when, whenever there's an amendment in parliament, there's a lot of dissatisfaction because uh, you end up with uh, not what most people would be happy with. Uh, maybe some people lobbied, like now the amendments were done last year, there are some areas which generally uh, it was back and forth until eventually what we got is not what we wanted and people are up in arms and implementation becomes a bit difficult. So uh, that process is actually very, very long and tedious. Even the process of gazetting uh, uh, rules, also quite tedious because uh, it has to pass through the ministry, it goes to the uh, AG, AG has to read all the laws and confirm that it is actually not in contravention of any written law in this country before they can actually uh, uh, publish or gazette the rules. So uh, I want to say that there are several levels uh, in which we can do this. The first is the amendment of uh, the statute, which is the Act of Parliament, uh, or uh, overall to come up with a completely new Act of Parliament. The second level is uh, making regulations, which is subsidiary legislation. And that's where now you, you make rules. And then, of course, at the PPB level, the PPB can prescribe through guidelines what is supposed to be done, and probably even so those guidelines, the, that is the easiest to do because guidelines, we just need to sit as stakeholders and agree that this is how we want to uh, do this. So once we approve the guidelines, if it is a matter that is so big that will require uh, or is not provided in legislation, and in this case, I can give an example, uh, specialization. Uh, when, we, when we presented these things to, we already had approved guidelines, and then the next stage was now to make regulations. Uh, when we presented uh, something to the AG, the AG actually refused to gazette because he said that is not provided for in the in CAP 244. And that's a big thing that you cannot just uh, implement without putting in CAP 244. So that's why we went back to the drawing board and made sure that in the amendments of 2019, the specialist pharmacist was inserted so that now there's something which is in the law. So basically what I'm saying is uh, if it is something which is not contravening the law, is not too big enough for people to object, then we can actually do it at the level of developing guidelines. And actually that's where we should start. Develop guidelines and then we go to, if it is uh, not very big again, we can uh, uh, regulate it through use regulations under CAP 244. But regulations can also only be published if there's a provision for it uh, under, CAP two, under the statute. So if there's no provision, you publish regulations based on a section of the statute. So uh, what I think is some of these things that we're already doing, the next level, what we need to do is just to develop uh, guidelines to help people uh, know, I mean, to standardize what we do across the profession. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, when it comes to, when you're looking at it from a regulator's perspective, uh, sometimes there have to be sanctions. So uh, for guidelines, sanctions most likely may be professional misconduct or something like that. For regulations and uh, for the main act, again, that may be something which may be subjected to a court process. So it depends on what level you want to operate at. Uh, just to say that 
the future is not very bleak. I think uh, uh, <clears throat> I want to encourage us that uh, the constitution of Kenya, Article 43.1a, already provides uh, the right to the highest attainable standard of health. And with that, it means that within that continuum, you can keep improving things and uh, encourage innovation and creativity in service delivery to take care of unmet needs. 